Wonderful. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Well, great. Well, again, everyone, thank you for your, your patience today. Uh, we've decided we'll show Dr. Barbui's uh, taped talk kind of during the lunch break to bring us a bit closer on time. We'll do QA after this session. And of course, all of these will be posted afterwards. So you'll be able to also watch it at your leisure. Uh, next slide, please. Here are my disclosures. Next slide, please. So I was gonna talk a little bit regarding things that we are better understanding as it relates to MPNs. You know, you're hearing some pretty key themes today. You heard from Yolti that MPNs might be tied even to the process of aging and that people's course with them, at, uh, forward slide please, uh, might be quite complex over their lifetime. You've heard from Serge Again, a variety of themes, longer survival, uh, improved quality of life. So there are many things that we're learning about MPNs that tell us that the, the journey is, is, can be quite complex. It's quite heterogeneous between the hundreds of people who are on the, the call today. Uh, and it takes a lot of nuance, both in terms of how we treat the diseases, but also in terms of things that you can do to try to uh, impact the disease yourselves. Next slide, please. So treatment guidelines that exist in the US and Europe now, you could think that these are kind of the guardrails. Next click, please. The guardrails regarding the science of medicine. So for a certain situation, an ET patient that has a certain amount of risk, you know, what are options that might be reasonable to consider? Next click, please. But how that is applied takes the experience, takes nuance, takes your input, takes the input of the difficulties, symptoms, and other aspects you've had of your disease. All of this needs to be factored in. You know, you could have an ET uh, patient who has ET who's 30 versus one with 70, and these two individuals are in a dramatically different phase of their lives possibly different medical uh, issues, complications, medications, et cetera, that have tremendous importance in terms of how they are treated. Next slide, please. So first, with MPNs, I know that we have people on here who have probably little impact from their disease. I certainly have patients who tell me, boy, if you didn't tell me I had the disease, I wouldn't know I had it, to those who are very ill. So next slide, please. So as I try to speak with physicians who manage patients with MPNs, we really have to have an individual understanding of what is the burden of the disease that you face. Is it risk of vascular events, blood clots or bleeding? Is it low blood counts? Is it enlargement of the spleen? And if it's enlarged, does it bother you? The symptoms of the disease that are linked to the biology as we'll discuss. And for most of you, the issue of progression, indeed, it is the risk of progression that can make these diseases the most problematic. And none of these things exist in a vacuum. I mean, you're an individual and your other medical problems, your level of fitness, your age, medicines that you're on, where you live, all of these things play a role. Next slide, please. Now, to better understand these, and this slide I think is just creeping in, We've worked and many of you have participated in trying to develop questions that can be standardized enough to be able to understand the symptoms that you have with an MPN, as well as be able to track their improvement or whether they get worse and use this in both assessing how treatments impact you, whether that's hydria, phlebotomy, aspirin, ruxolitinib, fedratinib, uh, ropeg interferon, uh, or experimental therapies. And we now have data really from dozens of countries in many languages and see how similar the experiences can be around the world. Next slide, please. Indeed, and go ahead and continue to click through this slide here. If we think about symptoms, we have things like fatigue, insomnia, uh, sad mood, concentration, early satiety, inactivity, 
uh, issues with intimacy that can be frequent, night sweats, dizziness, abdominal discomfort, bone pain, headaches, abdominal pain, cough, weight loss, fever. To see is that there's different frequency of those symptoms, different severities, and some of them are associated with the disease evolving. Some can be present throughout. This approach has become the standard in terms of the drugs and the clinical trials being tested in MPN, so we can compare between them. Next slide, please. Now, these symptoms can change during the, the long course you have with an MPN. There's the baseline health, inflammation, risk of vascular events. Next click, please. The cytoreduction can favorably impact these symptoms. Next slide, please. There might be things that might then worsen if there's iron deficiency or medication-related side effects. Next click. And you see there are things both up and down, both in terms of medication-related side effects, complications of the disease, as well as the therapies. You are one individual, and we need to always look at all of these things in aggregate. You know, if you're on one medicine to improve symptoms, but it causes diarrhea that is worse than the symptoms that you had, clearly that's not a good trade-off. So the, the total aggregate of how you are doing is very important. Next slide, please. Indeed, one of the things we continue to learn are the questions, why do the diseases progress? You heard from Yoti so nicely earlier today about these clones and how they can evolve over time. Well, what are some of the drivers of why people progress? We don't fully understand this, but at least part of the story is likely physiologic stresses such as inflammation. Next slide, please. Now, the symptoms tell us about the biology of the disease. People have speculated, next click, please, that are these symptoms just in your head? Clearly that is not the case. However, it is true that anxiety over uncertainty uh, can be common for patients with MPNs and can that worsen your symptoms? Uh, absolutely it can. Stress clearly can be a, a negative. We know that there's both story behind biology and mood as it relates to symptoms and their impact. Next slide, please. Fatigue. Very common, by far the most common, rare an MPN patient tells me they don't have any fatigue. And it has a variety of biological links from the blood counts, uh, mood can impact it, as well as clearly cytokines and inflammation. Next slide, please. The abdominal symptoms can be multifactorial from the enlargement of the spleen, but not limited to that with many linkages to the biology of the disease. Next slide, please. There are the constitutional symptoms, many of which become more prominent as we move toward myelofibrosis, with fevers being quite rare but problematic when they are present, night sweats, and weight loss. No one in our society pretty much loses weight without trying, and sometimes even with trying, we don't lose weight. So when people are losing weight without trying, that is sometimes one of the most concerning symptoms or likely linked with progression. Next slide, please. And there are microvascular symptoms that are common. They can impact concentration. I think they're more common than sometimes my physician colleagues realize. Uh, and these clearly can be improved with many of the therapies that we use. Next slide, please. Now, as we think about how we're treating an MPN, the course can be very long. Many of you will have this disease for years, decades, may die uh, of natural causes, hopefully in an advanced age. So as we, treat, as we think about treatment goals, there can be many. There are risk of thrombosis or bleeding. Uh, or is it to improve disease-associated symptoms? Uh, increase activity. Is it to decrease the size of your spleen? Well, is the spleen causing a problem? Uh, is it to improve blood counts? Change risk of progression or live longer? Next slide, please. So ET, next slide, please. 
Now, as you think about treating ET, and you'll see the wonderful presentation from Dr. Barbui, with both PV and ET, we have to realize that one of the variables we sometimes don't talk about enough is the issue of time. Go ahead and click forward. Over time, the counts are, tend to be high in the beginning of these diseases, next click, but can kind of decrease uh, over time. The symptoms can evolve, next click please. There can be risk of progression, but again, typically after time, sometimes 10 years or more. Next click, please. There can be a risk of vascular events. Next click. So as we manage ET in 2021, next click, please. You have an accurate diagnosis. You assess the risk and you assess the disease burden. You develop your treatment plan. Next click, please. We think about our frontline medical therapy. Uh, is that aspirin alone? Is that hydrea? Is that pegylated interferon? Next click, please. If that, if there's progression to myelofibrosis, do we change therapy? Next click, please. Do we move to second line therapy? Next click, please. Or is there a risk of progression to AML? Next click, please. There are unanswered questions. Both interferon and hydrea can be used. I see the chat box going as I speak in the right. Uh, there's obviously a lot of discussion as to which therapy is best for which individual. Uh, how do we prevent disease progression? Uh, what is the role of jack inhibition? And even as Serge had, had related, is it most accurate to think of it as ET or as some early form of MF? Next click, please. Now, there are therapies clearly in development for PV and ET. In ET, there's the ropegylated versus anagrolide as a second line trial that Dr. Verstavchuk and I are leading. There are several studies, including in my center, of the LSD1 inhibitor IMG7289 for people that have failed hydrea. In PVERA, there's the hepcidin agonist that uh, with PTG300 to try to decrease the need for phlebotomies. There's HDAC inhibition, and there are a variety of MDM2 inhibitors. Most of these are again are for situations where the current therapies are not doing what we would like them to do. Next slide, please. PV, next slide, please. Now I'll highlight a couple of things in terms of the unmet needs in PV. When we looked at the issue of symptom burden and quality of life from our hydrea versus pegylated interferon alpha study, the MPNRC 112 study. Next slide, please. These were the patients who uh, both ET and PV high risk on this study. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And we saw that with uh, the 111 was the interferon study. We had significant improvement in symptoms, fatigue, abdominal pain, and many of these symptoms. We did see that the pegylated interferon does come with some potential side effects, a fever and some pegylated interferon related symptoms. Next slide, please. We did see that uh, it was interesting. When we think about symptoms in the therapy of PV and ET, if you have zero symptoms, it is true, as you see in blue, that if you have no symptoms, starting therapy might give you some side effects. However, if you have significant symptoms, then starting on cytoreductive therapy clearly improves your symptoms. That's what you see in red. So it, as they teach us in medical school, it's hard to make a patient who feels well feel better. So if we start therapies, you are likely to feel slightly worse. But if you have significant symptoms, we can make you feel significantly better. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, myelofibrosis, we just heard a wonderful discussion by Dr. Rostopchek. I'll just add a couple things to complement the discussion. Next slide, please. Here, as Dr. Rostopchek told you, and go ahead and click through this slide, it is a discussion of stem cell transplantation, our frontline medical therapies, and what we do if those frontline medical therapies don't succeed. Next slide, please. We have the evolving JAK inhibitor landscape. And I think that we'll have likely four JAK inhibitors and it'll be, may evolve to a bit of a question, which 
check inhibitor in which situation? Is it people with really low platelets with pacritinib, anemia with mamalidinib, uh, ruxolidinib? Clearly, it's a standard. Fedradinib is, is a good drug that's probably been underutilized at this point. Next slide, please. We have a very robust uh, group of drugs that are being tested. Uh, most of them, I will share with you my simple approach, probably in combination with JAK inhibition. The JAK inhibitors have benefit, well, likely have several of them to have as an option, and I suspect most of these will evolve to be used in combination. Next slide, please. Now, from this year's ASH, and from some of the work Surge has presented, we clearly increasingly can say the therapies when they are impactful, particularly in myelofibrosis, probably help people both live better but live longer. Next slide, please. Now, there are questions that arise from this. And we say people probably live longer from the data we've seen with ruxolidinib, data that we presented from mamalidinib, data that's been presented from a metal stat. And that data doesn't exist yet for the other drugs like fedradinib, pacritinib, but I suspect that the same is true. Uh, so we have questions. Is the benefit for everyone who responds to a JAK inhibitor? That is possibly yes. We don't have proof of that uh, yet. It's difficult proof to, to obtain kind of based on how the trials evolve. Do all patients who experience clear response for spleen or symptoms have improved survival? The answer to that is probably yes, would be my guess. Uh, we cannot prove that kind of based on how the studies um, were done for a variety of reasons. But I do think that getting a response matters. And as Dr. Vrchavchek had alluded to, the dose to kind of achieve a response probably matters. Now, the third question is an important one that we have in our field. How do we better understand why people are living longer. How can we better predict that? Currently, the gold standard for proving this on a clinical trial is very difficult. It means that half the people or a third of people need to be on some therapy that ends up being worse than the therapy that we try to show improvement of survival. Now, no one wants to be on a therapy that ends up being worse. So how do we try to better understand this, but without having anyone you know, be undertreated in any way for their disease. Next slide, please. Takeaway two, we continue to discuss, so what is successful frontline therapy for myelofibrosis? Next slide, please. This is an unscientific slide, meaning these are not drugs that were tested against each other, but just looking solely at the rates of response for spleen and symptoms. You see JAK inhibitors used by themselves in the four columns on the left with variable rates of response. These studies are not exactly designed the same, so it's, it's unfair to, to say that one is necessarily better than the other. What we do see on the right, though, is that in a combination approach, and other combinations are not on here, the rate of response looks to be quite a bit higher with the CPI 0610. Now that's going to be tested in the upcoming manifest study, but at least continues to suggest that there may be more advantage to a more aggressive approach with possible combinations of therapy. Next slide, please. Now there are questions with this. Well, do the benefits we see, does it change our consideration for stem cell transplant? Probably not yet, but may in the future. Would a lower rate of response to spleen or symptoms be a good exchange for expanded areas of effectiveness in other areas? In other words, if it's a little not as effective for spleen, but better for anemia, does that help? Uh, possibly. Uh, for using two drugs, what do we have to prove? Well, I think we need to see the how many people respond. Do they respond better? Do they respond longer? A second drug might add Clearly, additional expense uh, might I add also additional side effects. Next slide, please. Third takeaway, do we add another drug when people are having a suboptimal response to JAK inhibitors or uh, uh, switch gears altogether? Next slide, please. At the current time, these are looking at second-line approaches, and it's 
too early to say, but I do suspect that rather than wait for someone to be on a jack inhibitor for a long period of time, wait for them to not benefit and then just switch gears altogether, I suspect we will evolve more likely to add other drugs in after a period of time, depending upon initial response. Next slide, please. Now, there are the traditional ways we've judged drugs, improvement in spleen, symptoms, anemia. There's others that are evolving. We don't still fully understand how to measure these in a way that predicts uh, improvement in how long someone lives or do they live better. But these are being certainly looked at closely. Changes in fibrosis, in uh, allele burden, in progression-free survival, overall survival, all things for us to learn more about. Next slide, please. Now, a couple of final words on other things that one can do to try to improve their battle against their MPN. Next slide, please. So our group has been very interested in asking the question, well, in addition to all the medicines that we're trying to develop, what else can you do? Activity, diet, yoga. Next slide, please. In short, I think many of these things can be helpful. Uh, our group has been involved with studies. Some of you participate in these studies that show that yoga, many of which can now be online, can be helpful in terms of sleep, improvements in depression. We've even shown improvements in inflammation. Next slide, please. There are ongoing efforts to try to deal with stress, anxiety, and uncertainty, both with calm, with ongoing uh, studies, uh, with meditation that have been beneficial and done in MPN patients, my colleague Jen Huberty from ASU, and then a study that should be completed soon in Mayo Clinic, Arizona, regarding a cognitive intervention for dealing with anxiety and uncertainty. Next slide, please. There are many questions with nutrition. You'll hear more about that this afternoon from, uh, from Christina Galwin, Dr. Fleischman, and others. I think nutrition has a part to play. Nutrition is a very complicated issue. It's hard enough to get people to eat well, let alone use specialized diets. So actually implementing them is challenging, but I do think that there is a lot there of opportunity. Next slide, please. And there are multiple ongoing studies, both as we relate to utilizing uh, platforms like the Calm uh, app for improvement of sleep, uh, as well as developing it as other resources for uh, cancer patients. Next slide, please. So I'll leave you with these conclusions. An NPN is a long-term chronic disease that affects everyone on this call in sometimes dramatically different ways. And understanding how it's affecting you as an individual uh, is key. Uh, if you start on a therapy, evaluating the impact of that therapy. Why are you on that therapy? Uh, is it successful? Is it not? You hear all the different evolution of the therapies that we have and how they get matched to you as an individual is crucial. People will ask me, well, should I be on hydria or interferon if I have PV? I'm like, what well, kind of depends? Uh, you know, who you are, what your journey has been up to that, that point in time. Many things that are evolving, including hopefully greater scientific understanding of other approaches that can complement, not replace, but complement the medical therapies that we have. Next slide, please. And with that, it clearly the efforts I share are uh, the collaborative work of many individuals and, of course, many patients who have been active, both volunteers and uh, providing input on the design of these studies with our MPN Quality of Life Study Group. 